we're, than we're that. just going off. But. All right. Uh, we good to go? Okay. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is John Duda. I am the executive director here at The Real News. If you're not familiar with us, we are a nonprofit newsroom dedicated to covering the leading edges of the fight for economic, racial, and, ecolo it's for the screen, and ecological justice uh, in Baltimore and beyond. I want to start, first of all, by saying how wonderful it is to see people here, to see all of you here. This is the first event we've been able to hold in our building since the pandemic started in March of 2020. All so right. it's really great to be back. <laughs> and it's really wonderful to see so many people out here tonight to talk about transit um, and transportation mm -hmm. and the future of transit and transportation in Maryland. Um, I, don't, um, I don't think it's really essential to, for me to remind everyone here how important transit is. I think you have a sense of that. I think the people who are watching on the live stream also have a sense of that. But I think it's useful to remember just a couple of things. Um, let's remember, first of all, that transit is, public transit is a public good in a very broad sense. One measure of that is that essential workers make up 40% of our transit ridership. Let's remember also that research shows that access to reliable transportation is the single most important factor that determines whether or not someone is likely to be able to escape poverty. Not schools, not family composition, not even crime, which we hear all sorts of things about, transit and transportation. And we see what transportation inequ inequity means for a city like Baltimore. One third of our city's households lack access to a car. A majority of Baltimore's renters don't have access to a car. And in many of our most disinvested neighborhoods, which sadly there are far too many of, households without a car approach nearly 80%. So this is a crisis, and our, certainly our public transit system has not historically seen the kind of investments needed that would compensate for these, these disparities. Our next governor here in Maryland is going to have immense power to affect this situation, and that's why we are here tonight. So I want to thank, first of all, the candidates who are participating in tonight's forum, Rashern Baker, Peter Francho, John King, and Tom Perez. I also want to thank tonight's sponsoring organization, Bike More in Action. I'll thank the lead organizers for tonight's event, Central Maryland Transportation Alliance and Transit Choices, as well as tonight's supporting partners, the Baltimore Transit Equity Coalition, the Fund for Educational Excellence, the Maryland League of Conservation Voters, the Maryland Chapter of the Sierra Club, and the Transform Maryland Transportation Coalition. And finally, I would be remiss if I didn't thank the amazing studio team here at The Real News for handling everything that goes into a complicated live uh, broadcast. With that, I want to turn it over to my colleague and Real News senior reporter, Jezel Noor, who will be moderating tonight's forum, and will say a few words about the format for the conversation tonight. Thanks, John. And let's, let's, uh, let's have a round of applause for everyone who came out tonight. Thank you. <coughs> All right, so we have a lot of great questions tonight, so I'm gonna talk as little as possible so we can get to as many of the questions um, we can. Uh, before we dig in, let's lay out the ground rules. For the first 60 minutes, I'll be asking questions submitted by organizers, the audience, and myself. And if you're in the audience, if you're here in person or on the live stream, um, you can submit questions and vote on questions via the app. Um, if you don't have access to a smartphone and you're here, um, you have a note card either on your chair or the chair next to it, and you can hand it to one of the organizers and they will enter it into the app. We'll be asking, um, and they're waving their hands right now in case you need, uh, you need to do that. Um, and we'll be asking some of the most popular questions that are asked by the audience. We've had a lot of engagement already so far. Um, and then for the remaining time, we'll be asking questions just from the audience. Um, Candidates will also get wo a one-minute closing remark. Um, we'll be doing rebuttals. If a candidate gets named or challenged, they will get 30 seconds to respond. Brian's our timekeeper. He will try to keep us on track. Please don't go over, because I will have to cut you off so we can keep moving. Um, all right, uh, any questions? All right, let's get right into it. In a major report released earlier this month, the United Nations warns humanity has less than three years to cut greenhouse gas emissions ne nearly by half to prevent the most catastrophic effects of the climate crisis. 
The transportation sector is the number one source of climate pollution in Maryland. How will your administration prioritize cutting emissions and addressing the climate crisis? We'll start with you. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you for having us at this uh, forum. Uh, one of the things that I <coughs> worked on, not just as an elected official being in uh, appropriations and, and uh, judiciary when I was in the House of Delegates, but before I started that, I actually work for the D.C. Department of Housing and Community Development, and we focus on actually transportation issues around hard places in the district that had been burnt out by the 68 riots. And then I went and worked for a nonprofit, and I saw the building of the Green Line throughout the district and the metro system. And we also saw the effect of how it was hard for folks to get from, you know, where they live to the job center. And so I remembered all that when I became county executive. And so the economic development that you see around Prince George's County um, has been based on transit around the blue line, green line. We located a hospital in the transportation area. So when I supported the purple line for the Washington region, I also supported the red line for Baltimore City because I know how important transit is for not only getting people back and forth, but also getting to job centers, but also doing economic development around there. And so as governor, I will know firsthand you know, how to help uh, local governments like Baltimore City and work with them from the governor's office and not just the transportation secretary. All right, sounds good. Um, Peter Franchin? Well, yes, thank you. I'm very excited to be here because mass transit is something that I've worked on for 35 years and I consider it, A, the right thing to do for our people, particularly low wage earners, but I also think it's the right thing to do for economic growth and prosperity in our state. Same thing with climate change. It's an existential challenge, climate change. Guess what? There's another existential change going on, which is over in Ukraine. So let's substitute it a little bit for my waking up at night, worrying about things. But climate change is right there. And we're going to take immediate action. All of us are huge supporters of moving into renewable solar and wind allowing Maryland to be a net exporter of renewable-based electricity. We're going to all act together on things like carbon emissions. We're going to capture carbon using these modern technologies that are available over the years. We're going to make our entire state fleet, I guess, electric. But guess what? So is the whole private automobile sector. They're all moving to, to uh, electric vehicles. So there's going to be tremendous momentum, and we need to partner with the private sector because they're the only ones that have the scale and the ability to move quickly into a net zero carbon emissions, which I'm not fixing a date on because it's very, very aggressive, that, that goal. But as far as the goal of generating all of our electricity in Maryland and all of the energy that we need from solar and wind from now to be a net exporter, of electricity to the grid rather than an importer as we currently are, yeah, that's doable by uh, the first eight years of my administration. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. King. Thanks. Grateful for the opportunity to be here. And look, transportation is vital to our addressing the existential crisis that we face. We've got to move quickly to get to net zero greenhouse gas emissions. I believe we could do that by 2035, but it would take a very ambitious plan to change our approach to transportation. We have to prioritize public transportation. That means building the red line in Baltimore. That means finishing the purple line. That means building the Southern Maryland Light Rail Project. It means extending the Mark West and increasing the frequency of Mark trains. Uh, it means <laughs> radically improving bus service in the state. It means ensuring that we have protected bike lanes and safe uh, pedestrian walkways and crosswalks. If we do those things, we can move from being car-centered to people-centered, which is critical. And we also have to build 10,000 charging stations so we can move our cars over to electric. Uh, we have to, by 2030, I think, convert the state fleet to electric vehicles, convert our public transit buses to electric, and our school buses. School buses are one of our major public transit fleets as a country and as a state, we've got to move those over to electric. If we do those things, that will take us a long way towards our goal of getting to net zero greenhouse gas emissions. There's more we need to do on building standards and building out renewable energy, but transportation has to be at the heart of our strategy. 
Thank you great. all for staying on time. Uh, hey, Mr. Mr. Press. Well, thank you so much. It's great to be here with all of you. Uh, I'm Tom Perez, and I'm running for governor because I want to make sure we have access to jobs, justice, and opportunity. That's been my life's work at a local level, at a state level, and at a federal level. And I've said for a while, the first thing I would do as your governor is to appoint a climate and resiliency coordinator because your question involves not just transportation issues, it is a whole of government enterprise. We need to rethink how we are doing this. We need to implode stovepipes. We need to make sure that we are understanding that in the transportation context, for instance, right now, you know, 10% of Baltimore residents can get to work within an hour if they're commuting on a bus. 10%. So you can't get to work. We need, to, I want us to be the offshore wind capital of the United States. But you can't do that if we're not building a regional transit authority. I agree with everything everyone has said. There's un undeniable unanimity about the need to build the red line, the purple line, Southern Maryland rapid transit. But we also have to change our culture. Take people out of cars and encourage people to go use mass transit. Mark system is not what we need to be. VRE is so much more efficient. If you go to the Virginia commuting system, we need to dramatically transform the Mark Rail system. And under our administration, we will do just that. Not just for the people here in Baltimore, but if you're coming from Western Maryland or We're going up from Southern Maryland. Okay. Um, I, mean, I, I will say that question was one of the most popular questions asked by the audience mm -hmm. as well as by the organizers. All right, next question. Um, Governor Larry Hogan canceled the, the red line right, light rail project in 2015 and shifted those transportation dollars to roadway widening in majority white suburban and rural areas. The NAACP Legal Defense Fund and other groups filed a complaint under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, which was dismissed under the Trump administration. Since then, many transit advocates and local leaders have pushed to restart the project. Will you tonight commit to partnering with the Biden administration to revive the Red Line project? If so, what tangible progress should voters expect to see on the Red Line in your first year and your first term? We'll start with Mr. Francho. Yes, the answer to the question is yes. And uh, in fact, it reminds me when Hogan was first elected, he, was, uh, he had campaigned against the Purple Line hugely important mass transit line down in my area of Montgomery County and Prince George's. It connects the outer spokes of the, of Lama, of the uh, metro system. And I went to him and said, look, you campaigned against this. You said it was a boondoggle and uh, you're not going to do it at all as governor. But I said, yeah, I want you to take another look at it. And we brought in a whole bunch of experts and to his, I guess, credit, he looked at it and said, I'm going to be okay with moving forward on the purple line. But the red line, he didn't. And I'm going to pick up on that. I'm not going to end the red line over on the, ed on the uh, eastern side at Bayview. I'm going to move it over to Dundalk, make sure we really connect the west-east region. And I may suggest to the local officials they extend it uh, beyond some of the uh, where they're headed on the west side. And most importantly, as I mentioned, this mass transit is so important to our economic prosperity. We need to have it understood exactly where we're going to have the development around the uh, uh, red line stops. And uh, that is going to be a real lucrative uh, contribution to uh, Baltimore's economic prosperity in the future. Thank you. Mr. King. Look, Larry Hogan plays a moderate on TV on Sundays, but the canceling of the red line shows who he really is, which is a person who practices dog whistle politics. Canceling the red line was discriminatory, and NAACP Legal Defense Fund is exactly right. What we need to do is build the red line. It has to be a rail project. I know not all candidates have been willing to commit to that. Westmore, for example, talked about an intermodal red line, meaning not a full rail project, mm -hmm. I think that's a mistake. We need a red line rail project. We need it for economic <coughs> development for the city. Canceling that project set the city's economic development back 30, 40 years. Locked people out of economic opportunity. So we need to move the project forward. We have to make sure we do it in partnership with communities. So we think through mixed use development, retail and housing at each of the stops. We need to have a neighborhood-based economic development strategy for the city of Baltimore. 
And we also have to dramatically improve bus service at the same time. A high functioning, reliable bus service has to then work in an interconnected way with the red line. And I will begin work immediately on day one, moving the red line project forward as governor. And I think we'll have strong partnership from the General Assembly and from our congressional delegation as well. You guys are really good at staying on time. You yeah. know, if you go visit with Barbara Mikulski and you say red line, smoke comes out of her ears. It was her crowning achievement in a, re in a remarkably distinguished career in Congress. And this governor did away with it. And, you know, as your governor, we're going to get this done. I'm really proud to have the endorsement of the Amalgamated Transit Union, your bus drivers, your rail operators, because they understand that I'm going to fight for them, and I'm going to fight for communities. And, you know, Peter, I appreciate your point about the, the purple line. We all uh, work together to make sure we save the purple line. You know, the one concern I have about you, 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 know, you you've used the bully pulpit of the Comptroller's Office very effectively. Um, but, you know, when the red line got killed, you know, your silence was frankly deafening. You know, you, 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 you went after the purple line appropriately, but the red line, I didn't see that enthusiasm, and I looked hard. So we need a governor that's going to actually get this done and is going to connect it with buses, is going to connect it with other rail so that we will truly have an intermodal uh, functional system around the city of Baltimore. And I will do that because, folks, I'm a part of the GSD wing of the Democratic Party. I want to get stuff done. And we have an unprecedented opportunity right now with all the federal transportation dollars to get this done. We will get it done. Mr. Franchot, would you like to respond? Yeah, I've... You have 30 seconds. Yeah, I just... My perspective is, after four years of my first term, you're all going to say this is the greatest governor for mass transit in the state's history because he really knows what he's doing. Because I've worked for 35 years in this business of how do we legislate mass transit, 20 years on the Appropriations Committee, last uh, six years as the chairman of the transportation subcommittee, 16 years as your comptroller. Every single mass transit project that's been voted on, and I voted on more than a billion dollars in contracts in last year alone. We're at time. Public Works. So, <coughs> yeah, you should give me a little bit warning so that I don't just have a stop. But yeah, no, <laughs> I'm, I'm more than happy to defend my record as a champion of mass transit. Thank you. Mr. Baker. Well, first of all, Larry Hogan did not give credit for anything dealing with the Purple Line. I was there during the negotiations, and, you know, I served with Peter on uh, Transportation Subcommittee on Appropriation. But for the Purple Line, uh, Ike Leggett and I sat down with Governor Hogan when he first got in. We didn't advocate just for the Purple Line. We advocated for the Red Line, saying, explaining to the governor how hard it is to get federal dollars to do these projects and how they had to go together go forward together and the governor said I'll think about it and I was pissed off I was like this project's been around since I was in the House of uh, Delegates in 1994 we know about these projects we have the funding here we had the agreement under the O'Malley administration so when he thought about it and he came back mm -hmm. he said well I'll only do this. this is how the purple line got done he asked Prince George's County to put 10 million more dollars in and Montgomery County to put 20 million more dollars in and then he cut the red line so he could show to people that he was being fiscally prudent, which was ridiculous. He was being penny-wise and pound-foolish. And so we advocated for that. That's why we joined the NAACP. But I said that we, that's why you see the Purple Line being built. We told him not to do it the way he's doing it now. Ike and I both did. And he went ahead with a, with a transportation secretary from the Midwest somewhere who doesn't know anything about putting it all together. So the first thing is to actually get a governor We're that has done it. We're at time. Thank you. And it's a reminder, Brian's helping us keep time. Thank you, Brian. Um, all right, next question again. This was uh, a question submitted by organizers um, and uh, the audience wanted to hear this, uh, answers to this. Um, and we're gonna start with uh, Mr. King on this question. And we're gonna alternate to, yep. uh, so everyone gets a chance to ask to answer first. All mm -hmm. right. Uh, Baltimore pioneered racist public policy like redlining, whose impacts continue to be felt to this day. A 2015 Harvard study found that poor children in Baltimore are dead last in the country in terms of social mobility. 
For decades, transportation decisions have helped shape race-based disparities in wealth and earnings we see today. Neighborhoods with the highest levels of poverty and unemployment also have the longest commute times, leaving families disconnected from economic opportunity. If elected, you will have the power to either make those disparities worse or make them better. How will you use the power of the governor to address racial dis disparities in transportation? Yeah. Look, racial equity has to be at the center of our approach to government. One of the things that, that I've argued is every bill that comes before the General Assembly and every executive action taken by the next governor should come with a racial equity impact statement so that we're centering our, our commitment to racial equity. In Baltimore, that's going to mean a few things. Building the red line. It's going to mean improving bus service because bus service is actually undermining kids' educational success. The Fund for Excellence in Education did a study showing that there are tens of thousands of latenesses, tardies for students who are getting to school late because of unreliable bus service in the city. Kids' education is being undermined because of poor quality transportation. We have to solve that with quality, reliable bus service. We have to address the asthma rate that's incredibly high in Baltimore, one of the highest in the country. We can do that by moving quickly to electric buses for transit, electric trucks, electric cars. We've got to tackle air pollution, and we've got to make sure that as we address environmental issues, we are investing the most in the communities that have been most negatively impacted by environmental injustice. Uh, the CCAN and NAACP and CASA asked us all to sign a resolution, which we did, committing to prioritizing investment in those communities that have been most harmed by environmental injustice. Yeah, civil rights is the unfinished business of Maryland, and it's the unfinished business of America. Civil rights has been my life's work, civil rights and labor rights. Here in Baltimore, uh, I settled the two largest fair lending cases in the history of the Fair Housing Act. One was against Wells Fargo, and I insisted as a condition of the settlement that we settle the case against the city of Baltimore. Housing discrimination is alive and well in Maryland and across America. The road to nowhere is a quintessential example of racism and discrimination at play. And as your governor, we're going to transform the road to nowhere into a remarkable example of equity, inclusion, and opportunity. Building, as John and others have said, building the red line is indispensable to our success, but it is insufficient to our success because we need to make sure that we are connecting people by bus and we need to make sure buses are reliable, they're frequent, and they're inexpensive. I actually think buses should be free in the city of Baltimore because I think that is very important. It is like a stimulus check for low income and moderate income individuals and it is an encouragement to get out of your darn car and get to work. These are the things we're gonna do. Civil rights has been my life's work and the transformation of Baltimore. And it's not just transportation, it's housing, it's education, it's employment. It's all of these things that we have to do and we have to do them in an interconnected way. That's how we'll succeed. Mr. Baker. You know, this is an important election. I know you know that. And we're all going to say what we're going to do, what we believe in. But given the times that we live in, especially after this pandemic and the racial unrest, it's about what you can actually get done. So when I talk about how I'm going to transform Baltimore City and work with you on these issues, it's not because somebody wrote it down or I thought about it. We actually did it. I just left in Prince George's County, Suitland, one of the challenging areas there that's been transformed because we actually built around the green line. Where are hospitals located in Prince George's County now? Move from an area that you couldn't get through by transportation to the blue line where people can actually get there. So our job centers over the last eight years I was county executive was based upon actually doing these things. You're not gonna have time as the next governor to guess about it or actually wait for somebody that you appoint to do it. You actually have to know how to get this done and to work with the local jurisdiction. Because if you don't know how the governor interacts with the mayor and the county council, then you're gonna be lost for three years. So you need somebody, and this is why I'm running, because we need somebody that can actually do it on day one, that understands how we put smart growth into real reality. How if we're gonna do free buses, that we actually know what that means and how you get it done. Because it's not as easy as just saying having it done. It's actually how much of that is going to be state money, how much is it local money. 
How much are you going to use from somewhere else? How can you transfer? That's time. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Franco. Yes, I, it's a great question. I'm sorry we only have 90 seconds each to talk about it because redlining is alive and well. I call it uh, economic protectionism. It basically continues the, to deny access to capital and uh, support for small businesses and families in concentrated areas of poverty, not just in Baltimore City, but also around the state. It's a huge issue. I'm going to be known as the governor who introduced green lining, green lining, not red lining, where we put all of the state's many, many financial assets into community banks and credit unions that are local in these areas so that people feel they can have some access to capital and fair treatment. We're going to forgive the uh, student loan of any young person who graduates uh, with student debt, college debt. We're going to, if they live and work and pay taxes for five years in Maryland, we're going to forgive their student loan. We're going to guarantee mortgages for individuals in those areas that are redlined. We're going to guarantee mortgages so they turn from high-risk mortgages into low-risk mortgages. Because home ownership is really the only credible path to equity and wealth for many of these uh, particular neighborhoods that have historically and still continue to be redlined. Happy to talk about the procurement system, which is a little more complicated. We're at time. Thank you. Um, this goes to Mr. Perez. Sure. As COVID-19 cases are again spiking across the country, earlier this week, a federal judge struck down the CDC mass mandate on planes, transit hubs, and public transportation. MTA in Maryland has followed suit. Do you agree with this, with this decision? Why or why not? Under what conditions would you as governor issue a mass mandate? I would follow the science. Uh, unlike uh, <laughs> Donald Trump and others who uh, follow science fiction. And that's what should govern every decision in this area. We need to make sure that we put our, the lives of our first responders, our frontline workers, uh, we should be protecting them. Um, I've, I've spent a lot of time, I mentioned, with the bus drivers. And uh, they showed up every day. You know, you can't go to work on Zoom if you're driving an MTA bus. You got to show up. And we need to protect those workers. And, and one thing that I really take issue with with the governor is uh, he could have extended the hazard pay that our bus drivers and other frontline workers were receiving. It expired December 31st under his order, but we had the money under the federal government to do it. It wouldn't have, it wouldn't have had a penny of impact on our general fund but he allowed it to go away. The pandemic hasn't abated, but he kept doing that. I wouldn't do that. And I'll tell you, the other thing we need to do, um, and I will again follow the science on masking, and I will listen to the experts, but the other thing we need to do is make sure that everyone in this state has access to quality, affordable health insurance. 25% of COVID deaths in this state we're a function of the fact that we still have 375,000 uninsured Marylanders. I have put out a plan, by the way, disproportionately black and brown. I have put out a plan already to make sure that we become the first state where every single Maryland resident has access to quality, affordable health insurance. That's what we need to do to address these critical issues. Mr. Baker. Uh, certainly, I, I would follow the science. I think Tom is absolutely right. Um, one, we need to make sure those folks who are actually you know, driving our buses and our transit are safe. But the other thing is, people aren't gonna get back on these public transportation if they don't feel like it's safe. If they think a judge made that decision who doesn't have a medical degree or a science degree, why would they get on a bus where they're gonna be in close confinement or an airplane? So one, we need to make sure we need to follow the science, but also we need to be leading this effort as a state. We have an oversized um, ability as Maryland because we're close to the District of Columbia to mm -hmm. actually lead the way and show the rest of the nation how it's done right. I don't think we follow what some judge says. We actually follow the science and stand up strong and yeah. that's a, a beacon to, uh, to the, uh, the rest of the nation and that's what I would do as governor. I would be on there talking about following the science, making sure our workers are safe, but also making sure there's confidence uh, for the people getting on there. Best way to do that, if you believe so strongly in it, is to actually take one of those transit, you know, when it's time, when the science says so. And you lead by example, and that's what I've done 
uh, throughout my public career and I do as governor. Mr. Francher. Well, I can never figure out what the science is these days. Mm -hmm. Half the people say yes, half the people say no. CDC says something confusing. I mean, the big problem for mass transit from COVID right now is that there's no, no ridership. And uh, secondly, as, as others were saying, the employees of mass transit are not coming back to work. So, uh, I don't know, I'm just a lay person, I guess, but isn't it something that we could recommend without sounding like we're too dictatorial or authoritarian or something that is in everyone's best interest when you're out on public transportation to wear a mask? Maybe I should have a mask on right now, but you get the drift. I think we need to continue uh, moving forward to protect not only our mass transportation system and our, and our employees of that system, but everybody, mm. until we're very, very comfortable with the fact that COVID is behind us, because it obviously is not right now. Thank you. And I certainly agree with Tom and Rashern about the importance of following the public health guidance. Um, both to protect the employees and, and to protect the, the riders. Mm -hmm. But I also think we've got to think about how do we ensure that a system that aligns transportation priorities with public health priorities, and one of our challenges in, this, in the state is around transportation for folks with disabilities. We have a huge problem with the mobility system where folks who have disabilities can't get uh, reliable transportation. I was talking to uh, Professor Jackson from University of Baltimore is an activist on this issue. She was describing two, three hour waits to get mobility service as a person with a disability to be able to get to doctor's appointments, get to work. Uh, the reason that happened is largely because the state outsourced the s transportation services for folks with disabilities and that outsourcing is not delivering prompt, reliable service for folks with disabilities. So we've really got to prioritize public health in all of our transportation decisions on masking and on delivering quality transportation for folks with disabilities. All right, we're back to Mr. Baker. Okay. And this is an audience question. Also, it's something in the news on, on a lot of people's minds. Mm -hmm. Recently, Maryland suspended the gas tax. While this lowered gas prices for drivers, it arguably did little to affect the lives of Maryland's most vulnerable residents, especially Baltimoreans who don't drive. The price tag on one month on this one month exceeded what it would cost to provide free MTA transit service for an entire year. Was the suspension of the gas tax a good idea in this context, and would you support bringing, it, uh, bringing back the, uh, the suspension? No, I wouldn't support bringing back the suspension, and here's why. Um, because it's not permanent. It's, it's mm -hmm. actually temporary. So unless you're going to make it permanent so people can actually feel it, then you're just playing with people. Mm -hmm. You're giving them a slight relief. When we actually should be dealing with the issues we're talking about here today, and that's our transportation, especially our public transportation system. And so that money comes from somewhere. It doesn't come out of thin air. So it means that we've actually spent our transit money on these temporary things. So what I would propose that we do is actually look at ways that we can relieve the real problems that we're having. You look at Baltimore City, you look at Western Maryland, all the problems we talked about today, that's where our focus should be. All right, Mr. Rancho. Yes, as uh, comptroller, I have many responsibilities. One of them is being chairman of the Board of Revenue Estimates. On March 10th, I uh, met with the committee and we announced that there's a seven and a half billion dollar, was a seven and a half billion dollar surplus for the state. That's something that's enormously significant. At the end of the meeting, I said in passing, why don't we do something good for our citizens that show them we are concerned about what's going on, I mentioned internationally, Ukraine, and the impact that it would have on the gas prices in the United States. And the governor after that said, boy, I think that's a great idea. The legislative leader said, we think that's a great idea and we went forward with it. I regulate 2,300 gas stations in the state. A lot of people said they weren't going to comply. In fact, they all did seamlessly because we took care of making sure they weren't left holding the bag. It was enormously popular. 
It was a small expression of support to millions of Marylanders. And uh, I would, I'm clearly on record as saying it should have been the full 90 days. And uh, it should have been. We had the money. We could afford it. We needed to do something to pick up people's spirits and give them a sense that the state was actually doing something for them. We were the first state in the country to do it. The first state in the country to do it. But unfortunately, we were also the first state to end it. We're at time. Thank you. You know, I think the gas tax holiday was a reasonable short-term measure in response to the sudden spike because of, of Ukraine. But it's not the right long-term answer. The right long-term answer is we have to move away from fossil fuels. We have to stop being hostage to despots with oil fields. Right. And this isn't just a today problem. This is 40 years we've known this. And each time there's been a crisis like this, we've reacted by focusing on gas prices rather than doing what we need to, which is to move to renewable energy. And we've got to invest in our capacity for solar, for wind, for geothermal. Broadly in our society, on cars, we have to build the 10,000 charging stations. We have to incentivize people to buy electric cars. We've got to move as quickly as possible to a net zero future. One of the reasons that we're struggling with that is actually something that Peter supported, which is highway expansion. And that's been an obsession of Governor Hogan, and Peter's been right there alongside him, including the proposed highway expansion around 270 with a toll road that's going to add traffic. The solution to traffic is not more cars. The solution to traffic is to move towards more public transportation, more bike uh, paths, more protected bike lanes, more walking, uh, more hybrid schedules because of reliable internet service throughout the state. We've got to have a much, a much different vision that's focused on a net zero future rather than the transportation policies of the 1950s. Mr. Franchot, would you like 30 seconds to respond? I'm delighted to have 30 seconds. Thank you. Because <laughs> Uh, this issue of uh, electric cars and moving into the future, by the time the American Legion Bridge project is finished, which I heavily shaped in the direction of environmental protections and the place of local officials not affecting uh, what, what uh, most of Montgomery and Prince George's was told they were going to get, we eliminated most of that. But the uh, the reason that uh, I'm comfortable with that is that I think, and I have a different perspective on this, I think we time. need to do mass transit and traffic congestion relief. And this is a very important program. So thank you for mentioning my name. Feel free to do it uh, down the road. I'm always happy to give my perspective. Thank you. Inflation's on everybody's mind right now. And so this 30-day relief uh, was something that uh, people felt, but not enough people felt it because we've already talked about the racial disparities in who is using um, automobiles. And so as I think about how we address the broader issue of inflation and how people are, they've gotten a raise, but the cost of living has, increased, has exceeded their raise, you know, I would be thinking about broader based um, interventions that would help the people who need the help most, like the earned income tax credit. The earned income tax credit, we could expand it even more. We've done it before, but we could do it even more now. Uh, I applaud what the General Assembly did on providing uh, stimulus uh, to people, short-term measures. Uh, we need to do more things like that that will help the people who need it most, not just a small subset of people. I heartily agree with what's been discussed about this, this um, Putin's um, absolute violation of human rights has illustrated vividly the need to wean ourselves with incredible alacrity from our reliance on fossil fuels. I agree wholeheartedly with that. But what we have to do here now as we address pocketbook issues here is come up with broad-based solutions with our North Star being, I want to help the people who need it most. And this remedy, short term, doesn't help enough of the people who need it most. All right, this question goes to Mr. Francho first. Vehicle miles per capita, how much we each drive, went down under Governor O'Malley but increased sharply during the Hogan administration. Will it be a goal of yours to reduce vehicle miles traveled per capita? If not, why not? If so, what will you do to, to reverse the trend? 
Well, I'm happy to take a look at whatever the studies are to deal with that issue. I'm not an expert on it, but I do want to say that, uh, in my view, uh, we are moving rapidly into the electric vehicle mode. Obviously, it's not just the state of Maryland, which John and others have mentioned, uh, electric fleet and us setting up charging s sections. It's also the, the private sector motor uh, automobile <coughs> companies. They've all announced by 2030, or most of them, that they're going to be producing electric vehicles. So that is an issue. I understand that obviously since the gas tax will be lowered because there are so many electric vehicles, uh, that we have to deal with the revenues. And I'm happy to take a look at it, something that makes sense. Uh, I'm always uh, willing to uh, suggest uh, changes and modifications, but we want to do something that doesn't damage the prosperity and the ec economic growth of the state of Maryland. So we need to be careful about what we do with innovative uh, tax policies. We should absolutely reduce vehicle miles per capita, per capita because we care about being able to stay on this earth and we want to reduce our carbon footprint, but also because of quality of life issues. It's a better quality of life if you are spending less time in your car, less time in traffic. So how do we get there? We invest in public transportation, make sure that it is reliable and efficient and clean. Uh, we do all the things we've talked about, build the red line, finish the purple line, build the Southern Maryland Light Rail Project, expand the Mark West, increase the frequency of Mark trains. We also have to think differently about street design. We have to think about transit-friendly street design. We have to think about bus shelter, so it's easier for people to choose the bus. I, I agree with Tom, making the, the bus free in Baltimore City is an, is an opportunity to encourage ridership. We have to make sure that people can safely walk places. Uh, we've got to make sure that, that we have protected bike lanes so people can choose to bike. Uh, we've got to make sure that we reduce the required parking spaces for new housing development, which discourages transit-oriented housing development and also often discourages people even from opening grocery stores in communities because they can't meet the parking demands. We have to rethink our approach and be people-centered, not car-centered. Mr. You know, I, I want to reduce uh, vehicle miles per capita, and I want to measure bicycle miles per capita as well. You know, I, when I was your labor secretary and throughout my career in federal service, you know, I used to bike to work uh, because that was a really important way for me to clear my head, and it was a really important way uh, to get good exercise, et cetera. And we need to be mindful of that first mile, last mile when we're thinking about projects. And one of the things that really angers me about this administration is uh, the Nice Middleton Bridge connecting uh, Southern Maryland and Virginia. Governor Hogan removed the hiker biker uh, provision of that, did it in the dead of night, didn't give anyone an opportunity to be heard. That's a 70 year project that's going to lose that. This is why we need a governor who's going to pay attention to details, a governor who is guided by a philosophy. And my philosophy will always be that we must be balanced. We must invest in transit. CSX is actually a four-letter word for a lot of folks. And we need to make sure that marked service, whether it's from Western Maryland, whether it's from Baltimore, et cetera, is accessible. We got to work with CSX on that. We need to make sure that bus rapid transit uh, becomes a really viable option. We need to make sure we're encouraging biking and walking, especially around here by making sure that it's part of the design and that a governor can't pull it out in the dead of night like Governor Hogan did. We're out of time, Mr. Baker. The best way to do that is actually create job centers that are where infrastructure is already taking place. If you look at what we did with the hospital in the county is that we not only made it so that you could get there through, um, through the, the metro system, and buses, but we also built communities around there. There was a Largo community that right there had nothing, but we actually put a hospital mm -hmm. with economic development and jobs. And so we do that throughout. We can do that throughout the state. That's the best way to do it. Because what you want to do is to e do economic development mm -hmm. where there's already infrastructure. In the old days, we used to call this smart, smart growth. growth. Mm -hmm. um, I still call it that because I'm old. Um, <laughs> but that's how you approach it. Then you do the biking part. We brought in bike lanes where they weren't there before. And, um, but it has to be where people can actually work, live, and play. 
Because if you have to bike 26 miles, I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to do it. But if we have the job center right there, where you can mm -hmm. bike to work, where you can actually do these things, I think that's the approach. But it does have to be a philosophy. You know, we had one initiative in the county when I was county executive, and that was our Transforming Neighborhoods Initiative. And that meant that we built within and provided resources to those areas where infrastructure was already in place or where we were building it like the Purple Line. Mm -hmm. you know, so any investment we did from a county perspective or any resources we took from the state went to those communities. But you can't have 70 priorities. We're at time. This next question goes to Mr. King. 29,000 Baltimore City school students rely on MTA public transit to travel to and from school every day. They make up an estimated 18% of MTA's annual ridership. Many travel upwards of an hour each way on unreliable, infrequent transit, resulting in lost learning time when they are late to school. How would you prioritize the needs of Baltimore City public school students? Yeah. Look, as a, as a teacher, as a, the former Secretary of Education for <laughs> President Obama, as a public school parent, to me it's outrageous uh, that we have a transit system that is undermining kids' education. So we've got to make sure that we have reliable bus service. You know, kids will describe waiting at a stop for a bus that never comes and then being late to first period class, being totally stressed out through their school day. It undermines their academic performance. There are kids who are choosing which high school to go to because they, the high school they really want to go to, they don't think they'll be able to get there on time because the bus routes are not reliable. There's also kids' experience of the bus. We've got to make sure that the buses are safe, that the, that the buses are clean, that the, that the bus, buses are respectful environments. Uh, that really matters for kids and how their school day is going to go. So this is a, this is a desperate need for more investment in the bus service throughout Baltimore, ensuring that it's reliable, safe, and clean. This is also col collaboration between the, uh, what should be a Baltimore Regional Transit Authority and the school system to make sure that we're getting feedback continuously from kids about their experience. Oftentimes when folks survey riders, they don't survey kids. They don't treat them as uh, equal participants in the transportation system, they are. We have to make sure that the transportation system works for our kids. Frequency, reliability, accessibility, cost. That's the four-legged stool of an effective public transit system. We don't have that right now. And you asked a question about COVID before. Until people feel confident, and I think uh, Peter uh, others pointed this out, and they were absolutely right. Until people feel confident in our safety, we're going to continue to have these challenges. But in addition to those four pillars, we need to build walkable communities. I spent some time with my good friend and uh, supporter, Robin Lewis, uh, a very transit-dependent colleague of all of ours. And uh, what, when we were walking in her neighborhood, what struck me was the number of intersections that we were crossing that I would never allow my child to cross because they are unsafe. And so as we build this out, we must be mindful of the, the, the bus situation. And I, I'm pretty confident there's you know, unanimity on the need to do all that. But we must also make sure we have livable and walkable communities. Now, the surface transportation funds, if you look at how they're spent, this is one reason why a governor is so important. Because those are really, really important funds, and they're all too frequently spent on highways, highways, highways. As your governor, we're going to rebalance that so that we're addressing these issues of walkability and public transit. That's a really important priority for me. Mr. Baker. Yes. Um, you know, children going to school oh, on buses, having, you know, all three of my children were bused to schools in Prince George's County. And the scariest thing is to have your, you know, child going to second grade in pitch black to get to a place. So one, you want to make sure the bus is safe. Two, you want to invest in, I never thought I would just be, you know, pay so much attention to who's driving a bus <laughs> and how they were paid, how they were feeling, you know, to make sure they were in a good condition to take my child to their destination. So here in Baltimore City, we have to pay special attention to how our children are actually getting um, to and from school. What that environment on the bus is like, 
how we're compensating those drivers, how we pay special attention, mm -hmm. not just like every other person who rides a bus, but to those children. What is the condition that their, their, their environment? I think John said that, and he's absolutely right. Uh, the other thing that John said, that we should pay attention around this issue when we're dealing with kids and buses, is the dis dis disability. Those children with disabilities, how they're getting there, how we're making sure that for that, mm -hmm. for that population, when they're getting to school and back to school, and even more importantly, for extracurricular activities after school. You know, I rode a bus in high school, a city bus, and one of the most frustrating thing was, because I played football, is that there wasn't a bus available after practice. How ridiculous is that? We're at you time. Know. Mr. Francho. Yes, this issue is not uh, just school buses. Paratransit's been mentioned. Uh, last year they had a 58 percent uh, correct being there to pick up the person at the right time. We did two big contracts in January and we're hopeful that hiring a third com company is going to bring that up to 95 percent within a few months. And they're on, on the way to do that. It's 58%, it's now 85%. They hope that it's gonna be 95% by May. Same thing with the school buses. Uh, obviously we need, we have contracts with companies. We need to make sure that they follow through on that. And that's what I've done for 35 years in elected office, both in the Appropriations Committee and the House of Delegates particularly on power transit, which was a huge issue back then. And uh, now it's 16 years as your comptroller. Voted on over 20,000 contracts, many of which concern whether somebody's gonna do something as they promised on time and on budget. So this is a important issue. I empathize with any parent that, or any kid that has to stand and wait, uh, but it's part of a bigger context of government being efficient and effective in the state of Maryland. And my perspective is uh, I'm the right person at the right time to make that happen. Uh, so, yeah, great. I'm glad someone brought it up. It uh, gives me food for thought. We're at time. So we're going to switch to audience questions in just a second. So if you haven't logged into the app yet and voted on your favorite question or entered a question, please do that now. Um, I believe we're at Mr. Perez for this I next question. Right. Um, Given delays and legal challenges, the next governor may have to make the final decision about the I-495-270 tolls, tolls Lane projects. If elected, would you ad advance widening the Capitol Beltway 495 and I-270 with private toll lanes? No, and here's why. I don't think that's the right way to go. Uh, here's what I would do. And again, we have to, you start out with what your philosophy is. Philosophy is we need balance, but we don't need Lexus lanes. We need to replace the American Legion Bridge, period, hard stop. We need to uh, extend the HOV lane to the uh, I-270 spur. We do not need to widen the beltway, and we do not need to have the uh, toll lanes. The thing about uh, public-private partnerships that we have to remember is PPP is not a transportation philosophy. It's a funding mechanism. If you talk to the good people in Frederick, they are astounded when they learn that up near Clarksburg, when the lanes go down from many to only two on each side, you know what the current remedy is for that? Nothing. Not gonna do a thing. Why? Because the public-private partnership said it won't make enough money. As your governor, first of all, we have enough money to do this without the toll lanes. We have unprecedented infrastructure dollars. And so we can build this. We have these Jersey barriers along 270. There are a way to have reversible roads, just like has been done in Virginia. We can get this done without having to do that. And we will use public-private partnerships, but we will use project labor agreements and community benefit agreements We're that will time. ensure that we have bus service, that will ensure that we have other critical amenities. We can't pave our way out of this, period, hard stop. Mr. Baker. Yeah, I, I agree with Tom on uh, the fact that I would not support a, uh, a toll road there. And for this reason, those of us who've been around long enough, I know Peter has, 
uh, he remembers this, that when we actually increased the gas tax on citizens, we said, listen, this will go in to actually doing the expansion that we want around the state, that we focus on areas like 270, 210, and places like that throughout the state to deal with this. We never told citizens they'd have to pay extra like a toll lane. That's ridiculous. And the public-private partnership, Tom is also right about this, and that is, that is not a transit philosophy. That's how you actually fund stuff. And we only use it when we don't have the resources. Now that we have this federal money, that is all one-time dollars. You can't reuse it, you can't, you get, you get one investment. This is a perfect chance for us to invest mm -hmm. in our transportation system throughout the state, mm -hmm. where we've lacked at doing that for the last eight years. We've invested in the wrong places under the Hogan administration. This is an opportunity for us to get it right. And so that's why I wouldn't uh, support that. Mr. Francho. I hate to have a different perspective, but uh, I happen to think that uh, we need to be able to do two things. People talk about balance a lot. Well, we need to balance off our priorities. I've already told you, and I am personally excited and committed to be even in front of you, being able to say, I'm going to be the greatest governor for mass transit in the state's history. And that includes everything that we've talked about tonight. Everything in my area, down in the Washington area, everything up here in the Baltimore area. We're going to do it because it's the right thing to do and because we need to do it for our economic pro prosperity. But I'm not going to leave out a half of the state which has a situation down in American Legion Bridge where the bridge is crumbling, needs to be replaced. We have a contract in place which now I think is shaped in the right way. It was an $18 billion contract when it came before me. I changed it into a $6 billion contract. Cut out all of the controversial parts, got the community to, to buy into it and largely and shaped it in a way which is good for the environment. But we can't just kick the can down the road and say, hey guys, no, we're not going to do that. This is a project that is going to be done when I'm governor. It's going to be done right. And it's going to be very respectful of everything, all the priorities that the mass transit community is talking about. Thank right, you. Mr. King. The Hogan Francho 270 project is a bad idea. Get, on, get an extra 30 seconds. <laughs> we, should not, we should not build the, the toll road that that the Hogan Franchise Plan describes. Uh, we should uh, invest more in public transit, dedicated bus lanes. We should consider how we could use reversible lanes. We should absolutely take care of the bridge project, the American Leg Legion Bridge Project, but we can use federal infrastructure dollars to do that. These public-private partnerships have too often been a euphemism for privatization, and they haven't worked. The 270 project is one example where the toll road would actually make traffic worse, but another example is the purple line. Now, yeah, Peter, yeah. You, you often point to all the contracts you've approved as, as, a, as evidence for why you should be governor, but the purple line project, all those contracts, they didn't work. It's four billion over budget, four years behind schedule. How do you defend that? You have 30 seconds. Well, no. Well, why don't you go on? I'll come back and take my 30s. Well, I'm happy to defend myself. The Purple Line's an incredibly important project. Yeah, the original contract was with a company from Texas that turned out to be fraudulent. It's under federal investigation for low-balling bids. That was a problem, but it was a problem created mostly by the litigation that ensued, uh, and that's the reason that we had to uh, separate from them and move forward uh, on our own. But this is a project that's critically important, and it's going to be completed. It's going to be done. Our it has been resolved, can... and it's important not to stand there and say, no, bring it to a stop. This is an important no, issue. And I, you know, I, you my have first, 30 seconds. My, my first vote on the county council was voting for the Purple Line and against the inter-county connector. And when I hear that, well, we've worked through with the community, the, the community is not in favor. I think the majority of the community is not in favor of these Lexus lanes. We are in, and the, if you look at the NEPA process now, climate change and equity are gonna be the lenses through which every project is reviewed. 
If you go forward with this, you're going to be mired in litigation. When I am your governor, we're going to do it right and avoid the flood of litigation that will inevitably occur with this project. Right. Yeah. Give me 30 Let me seconds. Get 30 seconds on the purple line. I mean, the purple line is vitally important. The reason the purple line was screwed up, it was Hogan. It, it was the, the governor is the one who picked the contractor that was going to go for it. He's the one who decided to do a public-private partnership. We had already thought about how this was going to be done. And so would I trust him now to do something along 270? No. You know, so the fact that no one disagrees that the Purple Line should have been done, no one's fought harder. I started a vote on that, working on the Purple Line in 1994 as a delegate, working on appropriations. All right, we're at time. So um, we're switching over to audience questions. Uh, the panel will have 60 seconds to answer these. We'll try to get through as many as we can. All right, first one from Kyle from Charles Village, Baltimore. And this goes to you, Mr. Baker. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the last time you rode transit. Oh, uh, actually, um, the last time I rode transit probably was probably a couple of weeks ago to go downtown uh, DC uh, from the hospital there. But if I got any time left, let me tell you about what I did and this, why we moved where the county administration is from Upper Marlboro to Largo. I actually took a bus when I was county executive to get to Upper Marlboro uh, for a 7.30 meeting. I got there at 11.30 because you have to take several. After doing that with my detail on the bus with me, I made the decision that if citizens had to come up here and pay their bills, then this is crazy or get to court or those things. And so we actually moved um, the county administration building to a place where we could actually do transit. But yes, I use the, uh, the, the metro and the, and the bus uh, a lot. But I'm in the Washington region and it's accessible and it's easy. If you're in Baltimore City trying to get to a job center, it isn't. We're so we have to make it that. So. Mr. Francho. That question's for everybody? Yes. Oh, great. I walked 16,000 steps today. I'm averaging 15 to 16,000. I walk, I believe, deeply in my soul that we need to commit infrastructure money for pedestrian safety, for bicyclists. That kind of construction, I agree, is super important as far as getting people out of their cars, getting them into uh, reliable forms, healthy forms of traveling by foot or by bicycle. So I don't mean to uh, suggest that that's, I'm trying to think of the uh, air traffic we took to see our grandkids uh, recently, but I guess that wouldn't count. But I think the, uh, the I love the idea of redirecting, and uh, Tom and, and uh, John have mentioned the federal legislation, which authorizes all this transportation money to the state. And they specifically authorize. We're at time. They specifically authorize funds for bicycles and infrastructure investments, but it, it's always had it off. That's going to be put in under the Franchise Administration. Mr. King? Uh, last public tra transportation ride was the Metro for a Capitals game. Um, and we live, my, my family decided to live in Silver Spring because we wanted to be walking distance from the Metro. We also wanted to be walking distance from retail and recreational activities. That was important to us. And we've worried about pedestrian safety issues. I remember the day when at the end of our block they finally put in a four-way stop. Lori Charcuti and our delegate fought for that four-way stop. And my daughters literally, it. you know exactly the place stop. where I'm talking about. My <laughs> daughters literally both screamed with excitement about the four-way stop because it meant it was going to be Safe. that much easier and safer to cross right. this major street near our house. So we have to build communities that are safe for walking, mm -hmm. for biking, and we have to be intentional about the policies uh, that are necessary to achieve that. I, too, uh, rode Metro recently to a meeting in D.C. We weren't enough people on the Metro because we still have work to do. Uh, I, I biked around the city of Baltimore with Ryan Dorsey, a supporter of mine, because I wanted to see firsthand on our bikes uh, how we can improve uh, accessibility for bicyclists in Baltimore City. Thanks to Robin Lewis, uh, we have these what are called raise grants that are going to enable us to have Dedica more dedicated lanes uh, for, for bus traffic, more dedicated lanes for bike traffic. 
That's what we need to do. In order to get people out of their cars, we got to make sure it's safe and easily done. And that's what our next governor, if I have the privilege of being your governor, that's exactly what we will do. Again, those surface transportation funds, they are all too frequently 98% for highways, highways, highways. We're going to change that balance so that we can address all the issues that bring you here today and bring folks watching uh, on the live stream. That's what we build, livable communities. We're out of time. The next question uh, will go to Mr. Francho. Multiple community and transportation groups in West Baltimore have been advocating for years for the MTA to run a Mark Express service between Baltimore and Washington with mm. trip times like 29 minute door to door from West Baltimore to Union Station. The results would be nothing short of transformational what is for what is arguably the most disinvested area of Maryland. Um, the MTA has the capacity to do this but have, have refused to do, do it so far. Will you commit tonight to supporting uh, this plan? Yes, I will. And I'm also going to support getting Brunswick line, which goes out to Western Maryland, getting that not just in the morning and in the night, but during the day. These are enormously popular lines. And they connect uh, employment areas. And I strongly support uh, the connection between the Baltimore region and Washington. It's two just powerhouse localities. Baltimore is going to be a center of global logistics. It's going to have an unbelievable prosperity down the road after Ukraine is settled. Washington, is a, the Washington area in Maryland, is already a, just an unbelievable pros, prosperity center where it's the intersection of technology and government. So yes, Mark Transportation and Rapid Bus Transit, frankly, are important options, and I'm going to do them, guaranteed. Mr. King? A absolutely, we should have a Mark Express, and it should be frequent mm -hmm. and reliable, right? Mm -hmm. and, and if you make it so that it's easy to commute between Baltimore and D.C., you will have more people who choose to live in Baltimore. It will improve economic development. It will help us. Mm -hmm. Fill some of the homes that are abandoned today in the city as we attract people into the city through investment in public transportation. Mm -hmm. We also need to build the red line. We also need to make bus service reliable and safe throughout the city. Uh, the other thing I, that, I, that I would note is that as we think about these investments, we have to have a governor who's committed to the revenue to pay for them. We're in this moment where we have a surplus. We're in this moment where we have federal infrastructure dollars. But if, if we're serious about these investments in public transportation over time, we have to be serious about fairness in our tax code and having the resources to pay for these investments, making the folks who make over a million dollars a year and large corporations pay their fair share. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, again, I mentioned uh, that three-letter word that is a four-letter word for many people, CSX. You know, we need to do a number of infrastructure improvements along you know, all of the lines. You know, if you live in Hagerstown and you're trying to get to work and you got three trains a day, and by the way, if it's a holiday, you're out of luck. You better drive because that's all you have. And again, when I look at the Virginia Railway Express, I look at a system that's truly um, integrated. They're, they are ahead of us. I'm not afraid to be a chronic kleptomaniac. I want to figure out how they figured it out and I want seamlessness. I want you to be able to go from Perry Hall down to Northern Virginia if you happen to work down there and be able to get down there seamlessly. I hope you'll be working in Maryland, but uh, I want you to have the opportunity to have that mobility. And it's about prioritization. What will people's priorities be? I served on the Transportation Environment Committee when I was on the County Council. These were the issues we talked about. These are the issues we will we're focus on. Certainly, I, I would support that, especially since I plan to move the governor's office to Baltimore um, when we're not in session. So it'd be nice to be able to take the, the trade down to, down to D.C. Um, but also because we understand that this is how you actually do economic development and move people into Baltimore. Mm -hmm. Just think about it, more people would actually live in Baltimore City if they could get to work in D.C. quicker mm -hmm. and reliable. So we should actually do that. And 
John brought up something about, and I think a very important issue is that is funding. As somebody who served both in the legislature and the executive branch, mm -hmm. funding is always the number one issue. And so the way that we actually do it, we can do the initial investment from federal funds, but then we have to talk about how we invest in it for a long-term period. There's a different okay. solution in the Washington region, uh, but there has to be a solution here. And it's got to be a commitment from the governor working with the surrounding jurisdictions, not just Baltimore City, not just Baltimore County, but Howard County and Arundel County and the rest to say this is a regional right, solution. The next question um, goes to Mr. King. Do you support taking land and altering the neighborhoods of Westport and Cherry Hill, Baltimore to create the proposed maglev? If so, why do you support, which is a privatized project, if so, why do you support maglev over Mark and Acela upgrades? And this is one of the most popular questions we got. I am against the maglev. I think the maglev is a bad idea. It's sort of a parallel to the, to the Lexus lanes for 270. Uh, the maglev it would be beneficial to very wealthy folks who could export, afford the expensive tickets for their express movement but along the eastern seaboard, but it wouldn't address all the issues that we've talked about tonight. We've got to start with build the red line, finish the purple line, Southern Maryland Light Rail Project, expand the mark, make bus service excellent and reliable. Those are where we should focus our resources, not... Um, a Lexus lanes for public transit. I agree with John, and uh, I've, I've spoken to people <laughs> along that route. I was in Greenbelt uh, oh, a couple weeks ago <laughs> listening to people there. Overwhelming um, opposition. Why? Because it doesn't give the community any benefit. It just, whew, you know, passes you right by. We have higher priorities right now. We've got to build the red line. We've got to build uh, the Southern Maryland Rapid Transit. We've got to finish the purple line. We've got to do all of these improvements to Mark and other things that we've discussed. Those are much higher priorities than the Maglev project. And that is why, for me, uh, this one just doesn't compete. And, and that, for me, is the bottom line. Yeah, it, 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 I agree, you know, which is why I didn't support his county executive coming through Prince George's County with the maglev. But I do, um, you, know, you know, think that we should look at the Acela and upgrading that. I like the fact that you can actually, you know, because I took the train to New York when we were doing, you go to New York to do uh, Wall Street when you're doing your Bondi. And so we would always take the train. Um, it would be great to upgrade that um, and, and, and pay attention to that. There are things that we need to do first um, at, the, at the state level. But I think making it more accessible um, for everybody. So if you had the Acela, you've got, you can go to Union Station, you have a stop here, and you get to New York. So I'm for uh, us looking at that upgrade. Mr. Franchin. I agree with what everyone has said, except I have a different perspective. I happen to think we should study Maglev. This is a technology that is obviously around the world, in China and Japan and other countries. It's the future. Maybe it can be adjusted if we pick the right route. We have the right partners. We're not uh, paying for it out of taxpayers' money, but we're using a uh, P3 that is carefully vetted because the devil's in the details on those P3s. But why would we turn our back on something and just say, uh, no, we're not going to do it? Because, you know, we've got to embrace the future. This, is, this technology is not something that is like out of thin air. It's, it's around in the world. And we need to be competitive in the future. So I will study it. We're not going to jam anything down any community's throat or take land away from anyone. But uh, we are going to take a look at that to see whether or not it makes sense for Maryland's prosperity and economic future. Thank you. All right. I believe... Uh Mr. Perez, it's your turn to go first. Uh, this is from Sue. What will you do to make pedestrians safer? Well, when I was on the Montgomery County Council, I think it was the third most dangerous uh, area of the state of Maryland at the time was uh, Langley Park, where University Boulevard and uh, um, New Hampshire Avenue um, uh, come together. And uh, I think it's really important having a governor who's been in local government because these issues are very real. And 
what I would do is follow the data. We know where the most dangerous areas of our states are. Uh, and I would, we would uh, make sure we have identified that and then we work closely with local government and the communities to make sure we have identified um, solutions to these. And again, I've, I've said this two or three times, there are funding sources that have been disproportionately used for building roads. I think we should be expanding the use of those funding sources to address these pedestrian safety issues. And I would do exactly that as your governor. Mr. Baker. Yeah, the, the area that Tom is talking about is, is not just in Montgomery right. County, it's in Prince George's County. And when I was county executive, we led the state in fatalities uh, for, for pedestrians. And so we had to focus on those areas, not just in high traffic areas you would look right. at, um, whether it's Langley Park and New Hampshire Avenue, or College Park, where students are, right. or Suitland, where there are no sidewalks, where kids were walking to school. And so what we did was we prioritized to make pedestrians safe throughout, not just for those who are walking, but also bike lanes. So Prince George's County actually expanded the number of bike lanes they have. And Tom is also right. It is very important to have a governor that understands how local government works, especially if they've been an executive and know how the funding is matched at the state level and prioritize it. Because if you don't have both uh, the state and the local government, which gives you their transportation priorities, um, then you'll be out of whack. And so having a governor that knows how to work with the county executives We're at time. and the mayor. Mr. Francho. Yes, my running mate, uh, Monique Anderson Walker, who is a local, was a local county council person in Prince George's County, enormously impressive individual. She passed legislation in Prince George's County called uh, uh, Strike at Home, I think it was, or Drive at, Drive at Home. That was the name of the concept. To completely reduce, uh, sharply reduce, and get rid of pedestrian deaths through automobiles. And it's been an enormous success. It's spread over to Fairfax County, into the District of Columbia. It's having an impact. The date, I think, is 20, 25 that they want to see real progress, but it's a yeah. tremendous program. It's wildly popular. It's actually having an impact and uh, look forward to uh, having Monique come up to Baltimore and talk about why it shouldn't be adopted in Baltimore. Drive it home. Hashtag. You know, I think about going to a memorial service in Montgomery County and Wheaton for folks who were killed by cars, pedestrians who were killed by cars, and listening to their family members' pain. This, this requires leadership from the state level. Three things that, that we could do immediately. One is more automated enforcement. If you have automated enforcement, the evidence is people are less likely to run red lights, less likely to run through stop signs. That will help to reduce pedestrian fatalities and injuries. Second thing that, that we should do mm -hmm. is rethink street design. More, street design should be pedestrian and bike friendly. It means we need sidewalks, it means we need four-way stops, it means we need to think through speed bumps. We need to make sure that street design keeps people safe. The third thing we need to do is lower speed limits. We should have a statewide default. The evidence, not only in this country, but around the world, is that lower speed limits in, in densely populated areas We're at time. reduce pedestrian fatalities. Mr. Baker, I believe you are up next for this, okay. for this next question. Um, <clears throat> in addition to the red line, what transit capital projects would you focus on for the Baltimore region? Uh, I th well, I think the, the, the red line is the most important one, but certainly we have to look at the bus system here and, and how do we actually get people um, from where they live to the job centers. But then we have to look at, I think, for the Baltimore region, is working with the mayor, the, the county council, and the legislators, um, how do we actually combine for the Baltimore region? So it's not just connecting with Baltimore City, but Baltimore County, Carroll County, and places around here. So my um, priority one would be one, you know, moving here, so you get a full understanding of what it's like to have to deal with the transit problem. It's hard to solve something if you don't know anything about it. Um, so, and, and, and looking at how we work together to look at a complete uh, transit system for, for this region. 
Mr. Francho. Yeah, I think it's important to get the Baltimore Regional Transit Authority up and running. Mm -hmm. Now, you really only need that if the governor is not in favor of Baltimore and not in favor of mass transit. So for eight years, I'm going to be someone who is completely focused on the mass transit situation here in Baltimore. And I commit to you on all of these matters. But if you have a governor who's not supportive, then it's good to have a regional transit, transit authority, mm -hmm. uh, like we have down in the uh, D.C. area. Mm -hmm. That's important. It needs to be funded by the local communities, by the state, recognized by the federal government. So I think that's something that I will leave behind because, you know, we need to get it up and running and we need to have it funded. But I'm going to be way out in front of any regional authority uh, during my time as your governor. Thank you very much. I, I've really enjoyed this evening, even though, you know, I, I guess as the front runner, I get a little bit of flack from time to time. That's okay, because perspective is everything. Thank you. Mr. King. Certainly we should have a Baltimore Regional Transit Authority. I think we see in the D.C. metro area of Wamada and how that helps to improve regional co coordination. And so we should do that here. We have to build the red line. We have to improve bus service and make it reliable, safe, frequent. Uh, that's at a bare minimum. And we have to do the work on the mark to, to build that mark express and to increase the frequency of, of the mark train. We also need a vision for economic development in the city that is neighborhood based so that people can walk to more things. There should be a supermarket in every neighborhood that you can walk to. That's not true today. A governor could help make that possible with the right incentives, uh, working to make sure we open co-ops where we can, creating the opportunity for people to get to supermarkets, retail, healthcare efficiently by walking, by biking, or on the bus. You know, I said that uh, less than 10% of jobs in Baltimore are accessible within an hour uh, for Baltimore residents. That's a terrible statistic. I was talking to someone about uh, my very, our, Shannon and my very, very robust vision for offshore wind. And this person lived in southwest Baltimore. And he said, you know, I love offshore wind. I am all for it. But you know what, Tom? Until we can connect people where they live to where the jobs are, you know, it might as well be the Port of Philadelphia. That's what he said to me. Because if it takes an hour and a half each way to get there, you're not going to make it. The most important family value that we have is the value of time that you can spend with your family. So that's why I think regardless of who the governor is, we should always have a robust regional transit authority. Because I think it enables us to think long term and to address these solutions. And I think we have to do even more. And as someone who sued a number of cities for ADA violations, you know, that's going to be a real priority for me because these issues are, are really existential for right the time. disability rights community. All right. So we are just about out of time. I want to give um, the candidates a chance to give a closing statement, but I want to, I want to give them a second. So <laughs> I want to thank all the organizers and all our staff here um, for making this event possible. Everyone that was able to attend in person and, you know, is tuning in on our live stream. Um, if you haven't heard of us before, um, you know, keep following our work. We're on social media, and our website is therealnews.com. Um, we'll start with Mr. Baker, because I was able to give you a... Okay. So. Yes, you did. And it's one minute? One minute, yeah. So, first of all, thank you for having us here and having this very important debate. Um, you know, you're going to hear a lot of good ideas uh, throughout this campaign. Uh, but we're in a very different place as a state and as a nation. The pandemic... George Floyd has just changed everything. So we need a governor that actually knows how to get stuff done. It's not just what you say or what you believe. It's can you actually do it? And the best way to measure that is to see what we've done in the past, actually done, right here in Maryland. So when I talk about transportation issues and how important it is, it's not something that somebody wrote down for me or I dreamed about. We actually did it after eight years of hard work and understanding how you work with the local government at the state level, how the governor can be helpful to make these things happen, not just in Baltimore City, but throughout this state. It's something I've done. Um, I implore you to go look at our website, reshurnbaker.com, but this is an important time, and we need a governor that can do it on day one.
Thank you. Hang on, don't get lose me seconds there. Yeah, <laughs> so here we go. Yeah, no, I'm delighted to be here, and I'm excited about the potential, and I'm actually very, very pleased with the questions. I'm running for governor because I know I'll really take the helm on day one and provide the experience, stability, and vision that we have to move our state forward. I mean, that's what we're talking about. Who can do the job? As your comptroller, I've been a champion for the Baltimore region, shown time and time again that it's up in its communities. I've made 321 visits in the last few years to Baltimore City, three, 288 visits to Baltimore County. Just the last few years, I've fought for better infrastructure for assets like our schools, cultural treasures. I know you, you know me, I've been around. You know that I'm about results, not rhetoric. When I'm governor, we're gonna build a red line. We'll have a Baltimore Regional Transportation Authority and we're gonna make biking and walking on our streets safe from traffic. I look forward to working with everybody in this room and I'm incredibly impressed and I want you to be right there with me when I'm governor. Thank you very much. Grateful for this conversation about transportation policy and really a vision of a more just and prosperous future for the state. You know, there are some folks who might say that it's a long shot to have a vision for transportation that is equitable and efficient, a vision for transportation that helps us get to be one of the first states to be net zero. Uh, there might be folks who say it's a long shot to have a vision for a view of transportation that centers people, not cars. And to them, I would say my whole life has been a long shot. Uh, when I was a kid, both my parents passed away when I was little, my mom when I was eight, and my dad when I was 12. I struggled a lot in high school. I actually got kicked out of high school. And public schools and public school educators intervened, saved my life, made it possible for me to be a teacher, a principal, lead schools at the local level, state level, and serve as the United States Secretary of Education responsible for an agency with a budget $15 billion bigger than the budget of the state of Maryland. I believe in long shots, we can get done this vision for a more just and prosperous future in our state. Thank you for coming here tonight. I like to stand, okay? So I apologize. <laughs> you know, I'm running for governor and I'm so proud to have as my running mate, Shannon Sneed, a former city council member here in Baltimore. We're running for governor because, and lieutenant governor, because we wanna bring jobs, justice, and opportunity. That's been my life's work. Trust is what it's all about. Take a look, I urge you, the, most, the, the best way to figure out what someone's gonna do in the future is to look at what they've done in the past. The next governor is gonna have to be the multitasker in chief. We need to address these transportation issues. We need to address the pandemic. We need to address the mental health crisis. We need to create jobs. We need to do all of these things and then some. I invite you, I implore you to take a look we talk a lot about offshore wind, but look at what people have said and what they've done, and in some cases what they haven't done on offshore wind, on every issue of importance to you. I'm proud to have the support of Robin Lewis and Ryan Dorsey and others here in Baltimore City who understand that I have gotten stuff done and Shannon has gotten stuff done as well. So thanks so much for having me. Thanks so much on behalf of all of us for your attention and your passion. All right, let's, let's have a... Big round of applause for all the candidates. And thanks again for everyone that attended and yes. submitted questions. We got these candidates on the record on some of the most important issues and topics we're facing today. And you can count on us at The Real News to hold them accountable there once go. they're in office. Thanks so much for watching. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I can't Good job. tell you how much I know that it's not fun. All right. Good job, guys. <laughs> Take care, Peter. Yeah. Have a good night. Thanks for the extra time.